Today's episode is brought to you by Away. For $20 off a new suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash GOG and use promo code GOG during checkout. Today's episode is also brought to you by FreshBooks. FreshBooks cloud accounting software helps freelancers master their admin and makes invoicing a breeze. Go to freshbooks.com slash grumpy and start your free 30-day trial with no credit card required. Tell them GOG sent you. Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks. I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. How's Manpoo land? Uh, the disruption land of Manpoo. Yes, I am in San Francisco in the mission, and it is, uh, well, it was raining the other day, so there's not that much man poo, or at least it's diluted man poo. It's more of man sludge. It is, yes. Manaria. Lovely. <laughs> it is. <laughs> now, little PTSD driving into town from the airport, looking at all the silly names of all the silly companies on all the big giant buildings that they soon won't be able to afford. Yes. And, um, just a, it's just a silly place. This place is just silly. It's not neat. It is silly. It is silly. Well, I agree. That's why I'm still down here. How about a little follow up? I've had this article in the show to follow up on for a couple of weeks now, but we never seem to get to it. And it's, it's all for you. <laughs> it's all for you, Brian, because uh, it's from VentureBeat talking about how Google and Amazon are hooking our kids from an early age. Well, duh. Yeah. Did you get a chance to go through this and take a look at it? I did. Um, I. It's definitely something I'm concerned about. Certainly. Uh, my son is still much too young. But even at this point, you know, I'm, I've got uh, I've set him up with his own YouTube account and uh, I have playlists for him and I play them. And, uh, you know, I am a, I'm worried about this. But to some degree, it's the same as it ever was. Uh, you know, Mattel, hook kids early. Uh, Fisher Price, hook kids early. <laughs> uh, you know, kids do stuff. The thing about Mattel and Fisher Price is after you hit about 12 or 13, you're not going to be using that farm spinner anymore to learn what a cow is. These kids are going to be using these tools for the rest of their lives. So it's training them to be users. Right. Which is a concern. And But I mean, luckily, he's got uh, two smart parents here, one of whom was a creator, not just a user, who is is keeping that in mind. And, and we're going to be setting limits. And But I mean, the idea of keeping kids away from this is also, I think, harmful. You you do need to learn these tools. You need to be smart about these things. You need to be savvy with them, certainly in the world that my son is going to grow up in. So yeah. I think it, it's a case of uh, suck it up a little bit, but make sure there are limits. As, as, as most things in life are. <laughs> <laughs> and sit him down. He's like, son, let me tell you about the reward loop and how it's going to train your brain. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, being concerned about that is, is uh, you know, I see parents. Uh, I used to judge a lot more. Once you have a kid, you you definitely stop your judging quite as much. But I, I know parents that, that basically have just given their kids a tablet and it's 24-7. And I want to stay away from that. I, you know, it's got to be divided up. You know, I'm a soccer fan. My my wife is plays tennis and we're going to get this kid out there. And, uh, you know, a, a nice, healthy balance, I believe, is, is the way to go. The one thing that I find interesting about this is I, I haven't looked into YouTube kids yet and, and these specific features. I've just made playlists. And so far, that's been fine. I, I you know, I handpick all the videos and things like that. And the pre-roll ads uh, have been okay up until a couple days ago when Google decided to throw some pre-roll ads for Ali Shawkats, who was on Arrested Development's new show, Search Party. Uh, the opening sequence of the ad is somebody drenched in blood running and screaming. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's exactly what you want to see right before your Sesame Street video. Um, <laughs> So I, I need to start diving in a bit more to see what, you know, what options I have. Even, you know, do I pay? Do I go through YouTube Kids? Can I access the other stuff that isn't uh, in YouTube Kids? What kind of ads? I got to look at all this shit. Yeah, you do. You know. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> do not envy you on that one at all. Hey, circle of life, man. Circle of yeah. life. I, I just feel like my parents might have had it a little bit easier than I do. <laughs> Go play out in the yard, kid. Have fun. Here's a stick. Here's a stick and some <laughs> dirt. Don't come back till dinner. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, there's some follow up. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, Facebook's plan to review new photos to stop revenge porn and how it was all going to be hashed and we shouldn't worry about this. Except, whoops, 
Nope, sorry. Actually, there are going to be some select people over at Facebook that will see your nude photos before they get hashed. Yeah, we covered that last week, that they're, they're definitely going to have people in that loop. That was uh, the photo mat problem. But what I think the most important thing about here is the naming of the project is, <laughs> is classic. The Non-Consensual Intimate Image Project. Yeah, what? I'm not entirely <laughs> sure that's even accurate, because I think at, at the point in time, it was a consensual intimate image. It's just no longer. So it should be the no longer consensual intimate image. Pilot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good point. Good point. Yes. Right. I mean, you know, these things weren't forced out of people. This was a, you know, this was a kids playing their crazy Snapchat games. It was consensual at one point in time. Yes. Previously consensual. Next time. <laughs> next up on Grumpy Old Geeks. Mm -hmm. Facebook, Google and a bunch of other news outlets. 75 to be precise. Okay. Uh, actually, no, that's not precise. It's arbitrary. It's more than 75. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, Jack has rewired my brain. He literally has rewired my brain to not know what arbitrary means. anymore. Fake, fake arbitrary. Yeah, uh, they're going to be using trust icons with fake news, which okay. is kind of they're just pulling anything out of their ass to stem the tide of everybody making fun of them. Uh, uh, better than nothing. I'll take it. But the people that need to pay attention to trust indicators won't. So right. Remember the satire <laughs> tag in Facebook? How long did yeah. that last? Or is, is it even still around? I think I've seen yeah. it twice. I don't think I ever saw it in the wild. So. Yeah, that was when they were just, uh, if you, in case you missed it, if you turned your head to blink, <laughs> uh, they were labeling sh stories as satire, basically the onion. And right. we're like, if you cannot understand that the onion is satire, then you have bigger problems. And it was, they're, it was so small, you could barely read it anyway. But this right. is just another one of those things where they're just, they're trying so hard. Yes, trying they're so definitely hard. trying. I, I, it's, it's a tough not to crack. It's it's I don't know if it's a solvable problem, but I do appreciate the efforts. I, I will give them an A for effort right now. Yeah, I just wish people would know their outlets, know their news. You know, yeah, if, if, see, you're that, that's yeah. the problem. <laughs> Come on, the problem man. Is. <laughs> you can't you can't put responsibility on individuals. We have to go to the institutions. <laughs> I know. I mean, I can look at it. I can look at a website and, and within like three seconds tell you if it's bullshit or not. But yeah. I know what to look for. Most people don't. All right. Yeah, Joe's News Shack dot com is definitely not a purveyor of fine journalism <laughs> is all I'm going to say. Yeah. Uh, hey, that's a good domain. I should go get that. <laughs> yeah. Get on that because domains are worth so much these days. Yeah. Don't, don't even start my thousands of domains that I lost so much on. Uh, Facebook says messaging apps aren't turning people into hermits after all. Oh, really? Let's see the study on this, please. Uh, the study is in the link on Engadget. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you go through the article? I did. I did. I, I call bullshit. But it's saying that if if you if people who talk on Messenger are fifty two percent more likely to meet up with the person in person uh, against people who don't send messages very much, but yes, this does come from Facebook. <laughs> yes, it's Facebook's <laughs> own study. Again, as we say, look at the source. Uh, look at you know, Wall Street Journal is not reporting this. Uh, a third party is not reporting this. This is this is uh, Pfizer saying that we've done a study that says our drugs are good. Yeah, good drugs exactly. good. You know, I, I, th what we found is that messaging turns out not to be a wedge, but instead a bridge bringing us closer together. That is a fucking press release, not a study. <laughs> I'm sorry, it is. You know, I and I don't believe it. I, I sure people are using Messenger to make plans. I do that all the time with friend of the show Fergal because for some reason he responds to Messenger, not texts. So. Meet at pub. Yes. See you there. There you go. But I know plenty of people, plenty of interactions that I even have that 10 years ago would have been done in person and are now conducted through either texting or messaging or whatever. So uh, I don't believe it. OK, uh, I, I don't believe it either, but it's, I, thought it was, I thought it was fun and I knew it would catch your goat it just did. a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Facebook also has uh, posted on their action plan against foreign interference. It entails hiring 10,000 more people to review ads, more engineers and some security experts. And they're all going to combine their skills into one Wonder Twin Powers activate moment to get rid of fake journalism. And yeah, foreign interference ain't going to happen. They're just going to waste a bunch of money on a lot of other people. Don't forget that uh, in this press release, they included both AI and machine learning because they're the advances in AI and machine learning will help. Can you hear the sarcasm falling out of my face? 
<laughs> it's a little early. I can't kick one here just yet. Look, again, got to do something here. They're updating their policy to block ads from pages that repeatedly share stories marked as false by third-party fact-checking organizations. But you're just hiring 10,000 people to become those fucking fact-checkers, so why would you need to go to a third party? Hmm. Make it up. Make, make up your mind. Somebody has to fact-check the fact-checkers. Who uh, watches who, the Watchmen, the watchers, Jason? Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> Well, uh, and something that they're going to directly be fighting against, uh, there's this awesome article on Vox. I, I know this was long and you were traveling, so you probably did not read this. Uh, but China is perfecting a new method for suppressing dissent on the Internet. China is actually leaps and bounds ahead of Russia. So if we really want to be worried about one particular country influencing our politics in the future, I suggest, well, we're screwed already. So it doesn't really matter, <laughs> does it? <laughs> Damage is done. Who cares who's next? Yeah. So but what they're basically doing is uh, instead of suppressing dissent, and punishing people with fake news, they are pushing positive stories of their own government. So it's all just uh, rainbows and sunshine and sausages and, and rainbows again uh, coming sausages? out of sausages. Where the sausages come from? Sausages make me happy, Jason. Okay. Yeah. I'm German. Give me good bratwurst and I'm smiling ear to ear. That's true. Give me sauerkraut and I'm <laughs> farting for days. Well, yeah, that's also true. So, yeah, they call it cheerleading content, and that's what uh, they're, they are excelling at right now. So instead of uh, negative crap stories like we've got here, they just say, look how great we are. And it seems to be working much better. So we should be worried. Well, also, they kill people. <laughs> well, there's that. So. You know, yeah, yeah. They, they use their, their wonderful great firewall to track down the people they don't like and kill them. So yes. if you don't like the happy stories, you know. <laughs> I think there might be a little uh, little bias going on there for people who just say, oh, that's a great story about the government. Yippee, yippee, yippee. Because <laughs> like the, all their neighbors are dead. So. Right. Uh, well, let's go back to UBI again, universal basic income. We've been talking about that on and off throughout the year, throughout the last two years. Um, there have been some test cases going on out there that we are eagerly awaiting uh, to hear about. Uh, and then Wired brought to mind with this fantastic article uh, the fact that we've actually had UBI experiments running for over 20 years now in this country, um, even longer than that, uh, within the Indian communities here. I did because not know that. We, what we, well, what we've done is we've given them the casinos, right? So you can have your casino on Indian land, and they take a portion of those proceeds and basically do UBI within their own communities. That's right. I read this. Yeah. Yeah, so I this is a talking. very long article that runs through the actual statistics of what's been happening within these communities, and the TLDR is this shit works. Instead of people just sitting around, well, there have been problems, and obviously it's a stereotype that you hear about you know, people on these reservations that just become raging alcoholics. It's an issue. But overall, what they've found is kids that have been brought up in this scenario uh, use this money to basically get them, pick themselves up, get into college, study, go out, learn a trade, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to really be working. Now, the UBI that we're talking about here still assumes there are jobs for these people to get to. Now, the UBI you and I are talking about are what do we do when there aren't any jobs anymore. Right. Uh, but it's, overall, this seems a very positive uh, positive experience with UBI, and it seems to have a beneficial effect in people's lives. So, Casinos for everyone! Yes, everybody gets their own Trump casino. Wait, hold on. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, the death knell for Blue Apron is on its way. Is the stock price now less than a single meal? I believe it is, actually. Oh, it's been that way for a while. Okay. Actually, yeah. This site, like All Recipes and Amazon have teamed up. So mm -hmm. you can use All Recipes to basically make your shopping list, then pop it on over to Amazon Fresh to put them in a bag and bring them to your house. And then voila, yeah. there you go. Well, I mean, Blue Apron was doing great when they were the only game in town. Unfortunately, then all of a sudden there were 20 other competitors who kind of looked at what they did and did it a little bit better. And then you got Amazon wading into the mix, which means you're definitely screwed. And I know even here now they don't deliver it to you, but you can go into Ralph's and they have Blue Apron style meal kits that you can pick up at the grocery store now. So, wow. Game over. You know, <laughs> game over, man. Oh, yep. my God. <laughs> I just did a stock price check on Blue Apron. Mm hmm. <laughs> Three dollars. Oh, ouch. Yeah. Oh, again, uh, as I say, almost all the time, I never understood why some of these companies went public or <laughs> so quickly. I don't get it. That's that's too bad. Yeah, that's too there's bad. some there's yep. some very, very funny uh, titles here. Yeah. From Unicorn to Unicorps. 
<laughs> Blue, <laughs> nice. Blue Apron tanks under public scrutiny. Yeah, Blue Apron Holdings stock can head even lower. Yeah, yeah, everybody's basically saying it's over for Blue Apron, so. Yep. But, uh, you know, hopefully HelloFresh will stick around because they're an advertiser. And I like, hope so. We like money. <laughs> I'm getting some on Monday because we decided with the uh, Thanksgiving holiday coming up, it was just going to be way too difficult to get full meals together. So we have HelloFresh arriving. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so you're not only a... Uh... No, I don't just shill for them. I actually order them. And I just have a little <laughs> follow up here on Parity and the story that we covered last week. So yeah, the Ethereum wallet company Parity actually knew about the flaw that locked out the $150 million worth of Ethereum and they just didn't get around to fixing it. So they should be pretty damn culpable about that. You'd think. Ain't going to what's going to come of it. Nothing. Nothing. And everybody's going to keep cheering on cryptocurrencies because, yay, they're awesome. Because some Woo! people that bought it now have a lot of money. The news. The internet didn't have to turn out this way, Jason. There's an alternative future, one where there. walled gardens like Facebook and Google don't morph into overgrown safe havens for Nazis or Kremlin agents to hide and thrive, one where misinformation didn't spread like wildfire, one where women and members of minority groups don't cringe when they open their apps. But here we are, 2017, and it all fucking sucks. I don't think it sucks that bad, but come on. What, 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 what is this you speak of, this utopia that we, we don't have? Well, uh, this is a law that lets Silicon Valley stay clueless. This is a very long-form article over again at Slate, and it's something you and I have touched upon lots and lots of times, but I don't think we've ever explicitly called it out as one of the reasons that we have so many problems on the internet. Um, this is the Communications Decency Act, which Congress passed in 1996. The law was originally created to prevent minors from accessing porn and other obscene content, uh, which obviously worked so well. Uh, and the Supreme Court struck it down the following year for violating the First Amendment. Uh, the part of the CDA that wasn't axed is Section 230. This is why we have so many problems. This is the law that says, in general, websites are not responsible for the things that users do or post, or as you and I always say, we're just a platform. Right. It's the safe. It, this is the safe haven argument, right? Yes, pretty much. So yeah. so this is basically a long article talking about why we've ended up having so many problems, why even Twitter's then CEO Dick Costello wrote in 2015, we suck at dealing with abuse and trolls on the platform, and we've sucked at it for years, why they don't really care to fix it, because they don't have to. So we change one little law and then they'd have to work on this stuff. Yeah, I mean, the big problem with this was it was about ISPs in the mm -hmm. beginning, because you can't you can't basically monitor all of the traffic over a given network. It, it, yes. it's, it's the same thing as like trying to police the content of every phone call going over the AT&T network. It made yeah. no sense and you couldn't do it. So that's yes. why this exists. But when it comes down to, you know, the walled gardens and the platforms. Nobody really thought about that because it was all going to be websites that did not have the ama the massive amounts of functionality that they have nowadays. You yeah. remember the old you remember the old school websites? They were like one page wonders and yeah. there was I mean, before we even have server side includes or CGI scripts, it was pretty basic. And that's when this stuff was coming out. Ninety six, mm -hmm. you know, I can go back and I can pull up my archives from my websites in nineteen ninety six and there was really <laughs> no uh, there was no way a website was going to be, you know, changing the outcome of a U.S. election back then. But yes, time times they have a have, they got to been a changing. Well, times, I mean, I would, times have been changing. Yeah, I would I would argue that there were things like that, but they just didn't have the mass reach. You had your AOL chat rooms, you had your CompuServe forums, you had uh, what was that big one that was up and based out of San Francisco that's still kind of around a little bit? Mindspring, Wellspring. I can't remember what it's called. The well, the well was yes, in San Francisco. The well, the well, the well, well was yes. in San Francisco. So, uh, but one of the, there is a decent point against this. Uh, I, I mean, we're saying we should get rid of this thing and, and make them culpable. Uh, the reality is if we made them culpable, they'd all be sued out of existence within two days. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's the, a problem too. So <laughs> yeah, where, where, where do you, where do you draw the line and where do you, you know, point, point that level of responsibility? It's comes back to, you know, he, 
the the power that these guys have, you can't just say don't use it anymore because it is so ingrained in everybody's lives. You have to have a social media account to even get some jobs, which right. I think is ludicrous. Oh, it is. And I get so upset whenever I see like friends of mine that have taken new positions and all of a sudden they start shilling their company because I know they're being told to. It's not their choice. Like, why are you posting about this? Dollar <sighs> Shave <can't>. Club. <coughs> Dollar Shave Club. <coughs> <coughs> mm. Yeah, heard about that one sometimes. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, and or they just yeah they they either show their company or they never say anything again. Yeah. And most of the time, when people get a new job and they stop t- posting on social media, it's because they're busy with their new job. But sometimes it is the gag order that says, "No, no, no, don't be writing about that." Yeah, you you got to be a good boy or girl if you want to work here. No social media for you. Yes, no no private life for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you can just go to Ello because nobody will read it there, I guess. True that. I Oh, I meant to mention this the other day. I finally figured out why I keep getting all of these Ello fans every week. I was like, you have a new subscriber. You have a new subscriber. I finally clicked on one mm-hmm. and just to see what it was. Uh, it's porn spam. The porn people have moved over to Ello. <laughs> Great. Well, yeah. So it's basically the you know the profile icons are just like uh, naked girls from the neck to the knees saying, "Hey, come check out my chat room." That's it. All right. If your wood falls in the woods, would anybody hear it? Oh, you have to go with the wood. Well, uh, yeah, kind of. That's, that's usually my <laughs> job, man. Come on. <laughs> I know. I thought I, I thought I'd delve into my inner Jason for a second. Yeah, yeah. Leave it to the professionals. Buddy. I will. That's la- first and last time. Speaking of leaving humor to the professionals, Cards Against Humanity Saves America was one of the greatest things that happened this week. Uh, 150,000 subscriptions sold out in about nine hours for their holiday shenanigans. Did you get in a chance to get in on this? I did not get a chance to get in on it, but I love them. I love this company so much. Fortunately, I got in, so I'll be able to tell tell everybody what the the rest of the crazy presents and things that they send are for the rest of the year. Because number one, we all know now is that they bought the piece of land that will stop Trump from building his border wall, which is, you know, funny and symbolic and I don't think probably you're probably useless, it, but <laughs> g- giving it the pro- it's proper due for the funny stakes. Let me just read the their own their own paragraph about this. Mm-hmm. Donald Trump is a preposterous golem who is afraid of Mexicans. He is so afraid that he wants to build a $20 billion wall that everyone knows will accomplish nothing. So we've purchased a plot of vacant land on the border and retained a law firm specializing in eminent domain to make it as time consuming and expensive as possible for that wall to get built. Slow clap. Right. Slow clap. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you have to you have to admit, though, that the best part about this page is that while you're waiting for your your money to go through your, you know, your credit card to clear, mm-hmm. there are <laughs> The, the the frequently asked questions is the best in the world. These guys, re- I really wish I could play this game because it sounds awesome. All you need are some friends to play the game, Jason. Uh, well, that those I don't have. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but my, my favorite one here is that I don't like that you're getting political. Why don't you just stick to card games? Why don't you <laughs> stick to seeing how many Hot Wheels cars you can fit up your asshole? <laughs> These yeah. are people after my own heart. I need to go find some friends just so I can play and hang out with the. <laughs> yeah, it, it it is a fun game, Jason. It's been a kind of a Christmas tradition with uh, some of my friends in Toronto that when we land, we go to a bar and play this for Christmas. It's quite fun. Well, is, speaking of Toronto, I, I believe that you have some news about Toronto, Brian. Well, yes, I kept that in here just because I go here all the time. Lyft is finally getting into Toronto, Canada. It'll be the first international city, so the Lyft-Uber battle can continue internationally. <laughs> Um, well, enjoy that. And, you know, because I I, I am coming or I am now in San Francisco. I'm staying in an Airbnb. And when I left Chicago, I did have to Uber to the airport. It's like, (laughs) oh, I I hope you enjoy your smashed avocado lunch. I feel so dirty. (laughs) You should. I'm I'm ashamed. Hey, but when I got to SFO, I did take a cab, a yellow cab, and it was a fucking Prius uh, into the city, which, you know, and so the cost of the cab and the cost of the Uber in both places, half the distance in San Francisco, twice as much as the the cab to or the Uber to the airport in Chicago. So, yeah, uh, but now you can tip an Uber. So I thought that was nice. So I gave my driver a good tip because he was a good guy. Oh, now, God, Twitter, fucking Twitter. (laughs) 
they they did the, that really stupid thing a long time ago where basically they they kneecapped everybody who was making their platform popular with mm-hmm. all of the cool apps that you could you could use to access Twitter. Yep. Cut off the API and said no API for you unless you're a big player. And if you still want to play with the API, here's like six requests you can do a week and then, you know, before your tokens reset. So now they're they're introducing what they call premium APIs, which fills that gap between the utterly useless API access that everybody has right now and the enterprise access, which people with real money can get. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what do you think? Too little, too late? Too little, too late. Basically, is should be the new name of Twitter. <laughs> yeah. You know none, how they've introduced yeah. long names. It should now be Twitter. Too little, too late. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, I think I think my new username is Commander Jason Peter DeFilippo Esquire. I went with slender. What could possibly go wrong? Fungus. <laughs> you should just be shocking. <laughs> <laughs> God, can can we get to January first sooner, please? Give a I time know. machine. Can we get to January first? Was it twenty twenty two or twenty twenty? <laughs> uh, that one would be better. Yes. Remember, okay. Let's let's talk about a little Bitcoinage here. Okay. Mount Gox, Mount Gox, the notorious exchange, and uh, with, it has the CEO Mark Carpellis or Carpellis. Mm-hmm. I thought well, Mount Gox was the uh, lizard that Captain Kirk fought in the original Star Trek. Nope, sorry. Okay. This was uh, the yeah, this was the the card game that they, they thought that hey, we're gonna be on the Magic the Gathering card game website. You know what we should do next? We should go into financial services. Yeah, that makes sense. Does anybody grow up anymore? No, oh, fuck no. Okay, just checking. God no. Um, so this guy. You know, the, he had a whole lot of Bitcoin that were, quote unquote, stolen. Mm-hmm. So but he's in, on trial in Japan for extortion. OK. And the company got back about 200,000 of the Bitcoin mm-hmm. that were missing. And so the people whose Bitcoin were, were, were stolen get restitution on that. Mm-hmm. Here's the here's the rub. The, the restitution comes at, at the Bitcoin price from when it was stolen. Oh. Which okay. is tw- which was on, in 2014, where Bitcoin were $440 a Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And uh, in a in a Uber ride yesterday, like uh, some of the people I was with are Bitcoin investors and rich people. I'm, I was just in the back holding the luggage and, you know, cleaning the shoes. Bitcoin like broke for a little bit. I guess it broke $8,000 a Bitcoin yesterday. Yeah. So this guy has 200,000 Bitcoin that he has to pay back for people at $440. So he is going to walk away with a couple hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin, probably. Most likely. For stealing it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There is no justice. There is no, no justice. There really isn't. Now it's Japan, so maybe they can just give him a knife and have him cut his stomach open, which would be the proper way to do it. But uh, <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Somebody's, you know. Oh, and here's the other thing. I'm talking to some people about Bitcoin because I am in San Francisco and things happen like this. And I was hearing a story about how one guy got like $2 million worth of Bitcoin stolen from him from a bad, uh, you know, just a bad broker. Mm-hmm. And now in my world, if somebody stole $2 million from you and you knew who they were and they still showed up at work every day, that person <laughs> would be dead by the afternoon. <laughs> $15,000 would take care of that problem really quickly. Yep. But these guys are just, a, they, they trade snarky emails and get mad at each other and probably won't go to the same kombucha bar ever again. It's just like, it's a different world and it's just, it's kind of disgusting. It yeah. Really. It's like, ugh, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, speaking of the CompuServe's forums and, and a gentler, nicer time on the internet when, before the unwashed masses and the greedy barbarians at the gate came along, when you could just go onto a forum and ask a question and actually get a real answer. And the signal to noise ratio was really high. Oh, those good old days. Well, they're going away for good. I didn't even know they were still around. So this was a hell of a story for me. But the CompuServe forums still exist and will until December 15th when they will finally be removed and go away. Is anybody archiving them or? I dearly hope so, because what a treasure trove of history that would be. 
Well, you got a couple days, so go write a, <laughs> go write a script and hop on in there. Right. I don't even know how you would get there. I don't or... even know how you get there either. So, but amazing. It's just amazing that they were still around and uh, sad to hear that they're actually going away. Yeah, I was never on CompuServe. I was a prodigy and AOL guy, but because CompuServe mm-hmm. was a, was a, just expensive, I didn't have yeah. that kind. I didn't have that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> Still don't. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, I used to work at Kinko's back then, and I, hey, pretty soon I might be doing it again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for the four people in the world that need copies. <laughs> Would you like those collated and bound, sir? I can fire yes, up please. the laminator for you. Oh, um, Bill Gates yes. is funding a smart city, mm-hmm. and it's some it's it's in our favorite place. It's like right outside of Phoenix. Ugh. Well, this is from Bill Gates. I'm a little concerned on how long it'll take that smart city to boot up every morning. <laughs> yeah, some days, some days you just wake up, you look outside the window, and it's really blue. This no, not the all blue you sky. see is the that's window because the- <laughs> <laughs> it's just a window. <laughs> With a little line underneath it moving back and forth. <laughs> yeah, they don't have they, they don't have bell towers in the city. They just play the startup sound at the the beginning of every day. <laughs> uh, okay, we're making a lot of fun of it, but I'm super interested in this. I'm very curious about how it's going to be planned out. And if it weren't in Phoenix, I would or in Arizona in general, I would actually consider moving there. Ah, uh, no, you wouldn't, because you're going to Canada. That's true. Today's show is brought to you by Away. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash GOG and use promo code GOG during checkout. Away bags and accessories make for the perfect gift with their lifetime guarantee 100-day trial, so there's a perfect size and color for everyone on your list this holiday season. Or grab an Away gift card if you can't make up your mind. You can choose from over 10 colors and 5 sizes, the carry-on, the bigger carry-on, the medium, the large, or the kids' carry-on. My wife and I just dropped the kid off at the grandparents and spent our first night away, and the carry-on was the perfect size for all the stuff that we needed to bring with us, including all the tech we wanted to bring with us. The carry-on can charge all cell phones, tablets, e-readers, and anything else that's powered by a USB cord. A single charge of the away carry-on will charge your iPhone up to five times, so that helps. All suitcases made with premium German polycarbonate that's very lightweight and bends but never breaks. My kid has slammed this thing around and it stands all of it. The interior features a patent-pended compression system, helpful for overpackers. There are four 360-degree spinner wheels, guaranteeing a smooth ride. Its TSA-approved combination lock is built into the top of the bag to prevent theft. A removable, washable laundry bag keeps dirty clothes separate from the clean. If you're anal like I am, that's fantastic. And don't forget, there's a 100-day trial. You can live with it, travel with it, Instagram it. If at any point you decide it's not for you, return it for a full refund with no questions asked. Again, for $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash GOG and use promo code GOG. This episode of Grumpy Old Geeks is brought to you by FreshBooks. The internet has enabled more people to become self-employed professionals and small business owners. More connected and mobile, more autonomous, and working in jobs that could not have been imagined just a few years ago. Only five to ten years ago, working for yourself was considered taboo and looked down upon. Today, one in three Americans is self-employed. With the growth of the internet, there's never been more opportunities for the self-employed. Trust me, I know. And if you've listened to this show before, you know we're a couple of old hounds at working for yourself. To meet this need, FreshBooks is excited to announce the launch of an all-new version of their cloud accounting software. FreshBooks has been redesigned from the ground up and custom built for exactly the way you work. Get ready for the simplest way to be more productive, organized, and most importantly, get paid quickly. The all new FreshBooks is not only ridiculously easy to use, it's also packed full of powerful features. Create and send professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. It is so easy to make and send an invoice. It, it, it'll just blow your mind. If you've ever had to like open up an old Word doc, change the template, do the math by hand. Oh, it's amazing. You can set up online payments with just a couple clicks and get paid up to four days faster. All my clients pay by credit card now. They could never do that before. I could, I did, I couldn't do that. Now they can. It's great. And you can see when your client has seen your invoice and put an end to those guessing games where they're like, I, I didn't get the email. Maybe it's in my spam folder. Uh, uh, uh. I know you saw it last Thursday. Cough up the goods, buddy. I use FreshBooks every day because we're not just taking their money to show their product. I'm a user and a very, very satisfied one. 
FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to our listeners here at the Grumpy Old Geeks. To claim it, just go to FreshBooks.com slash Grumpy and enter Grumpy Old Geeks in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Being a freelancer and business owner is hard enough. Let FreshBooks help. That's FreshBooks.com slash Grumpy and enter Grumpy Old Geeks in the How Did You Hear About Us section. You've got nothing to lose. Give it a shot. See how amazing it is. Ups and doodads. I found this next piece of... uh, interesting news on futurism which is one, mm-hmm. which is a pretty decent site sometimes they're a little too far in the future if you know what i'm yes. saying <laughs> um researchers at dracula technologies named the, for the win oh that, that, that the only reason I'm, I'm putting this story in here is because <laughs> somebody had the balls to name their company dracula technologies which i fucking love i'm sure they're gonna get sued <laughs> I think, well, you never know with copyright, you know, Bram Stoker's uh, kin may have come back and thrown it out of the public domain, Uh, but they've devised a method to charge cell phones with ambient light. Uh, They created a thin, flexible solar cell that can be printed in any shape or color using an inkjet printer. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool stuff. The video is interesting. It doesn't really have much on yield or things like that, but they're saying it might be coming to market soon. But come on, I don't really care dracula technologies for the win (laughs) definitely yeah this is cool stuff i'll i'll i would love to see this on the market i think it's going to be a while still yes it's it's, you know it's a little too new Mm -hmm. uh the next thing that i found was i i really wanted this to be the coolest thing ever because we've talked in the past about star trek communicators Mm -hmm. that are bluetooth handsets that you know you can flip open they play the play the music or the sounds and you can use them as a bluetooth phone and i tried to buy one and they were like you know two years out and i eventually canceled it because i'm like you know what i'm paying it it was gonna be like 175 bucks if you ordered it then Mm -hmm. and then you're gonna get it in two years i'm like i can put that 175 bucks in an investment account somewhere and then actually get the cheaper version after it comes out in three years anyway i did never got one of those things but i found the star trek next generation bluetooth com badge right I thought this was going to be the coolest thing ever. So you could just use 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 the old school like, you know, card to data, mm-hmm. you know, get me some get me a latte. I found this on ThinkGeek. It looked really cool, but then mm-hmm. then I watched the video that accompanies <laughs> and I it, it it the cool factor for it has just been completely destroyed. Somebody somebody put some photon torpedoes into the coolness factor on this one and the $80 Star Trek Bluetooth Com badge <laughs> will never enter my home. Did you watch this video, Brian? I feel very bad about this because it does seem like it's a cool product, and I think that they have done themselves a massive disservice with their attempt at being hilarious with their video. It is so <laughs> mind-numbingly, painfully terrible. Like, there are things on Funny or Die that make me just want to go die. This makes me want to die a thousand times. Yeah, way to way to re- you know they had to have meetings. Get a writer, <laughs> they had to have just meetings. Bu- hire a writer, hire someone funny. You must have a funny friend and an actor or two that are actually funny, or just do a product video. That's all I would wanted to see. Hey, here, here's how it works. Yeah, here you go. You tap it. You make a phone call. You tap it again. You can play your music, uh, and it that's makes it. the noise. It's need. licensed. Look, it's cool. <laughs> That would have been it. I'm sorry it ruined it for you. I understand. I mean, I I think you should get it anyways, because it does look like a good product. Uh, just let let the video go. I'm not going to spend 80 bucks on it. That's the other problem. It is a lot of money for what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's cheaper than the cheaper than the communicator. That, like I said, was like closer to 200 bucks. But right. You and I are both still using Opera full time as our browser. Um, I gave Firefox Quantum a go this week because they just released their new thing. It's fast. Uh, noticeably faster than than previous firefox but there's i just i can't go back to the browser wars i just can't and and switching a browser more than once in a year is not in me so i'm i have no problems with opera i think opera is just as fast as quantum but if you are a firefox person and and as you well should be if i were just going to be ethical about this i suppose i would go with mozilla as a company for my browser needs but uh whatever i like opera I'm not switching. Okay, yeah, I covered Firefox Quantum when it was uh, first announced in beta a couple, what was it, like two months ago, maybe? Yeah, and it's I, no I noticed longer in it was, beta. Yeah, it's out now, and I definitely noticed it was faster, and I got this new version, I fired it up, and honestly, I could not tell the difference between the speed in Quantum and Opera. I was 
going yeah. between different sites and on computers that are basically the same. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to do them on the same computer to, you know, stop resources and stuff. But I did like a, a kind of a semi-scientific test and I could barely tell the difference. Yeah, it may be a little bit faster than Opera. It probably is because it's just newer, but uh, not enough for me to switch. Nope. Remember Boston Dynamics? Oh, boy, do I. Yeah, they used to be owned by Alphabet, a.k.a. slash Google, and they've been sold off, and which is probably good for them. They, they need to do something. But they had an ad this week for the Spot Mini that is coming soon. Mm-hmm. Fuck Ibo. I want a I Spot Mini. I was about Mini. to say... <laughs> Yeah, fuck your Ibo and your and your twenty six dollar a month subscription. This thing is what I want as a guard dog because the video that it shows, it just kind of walks into the frame, stops, and then looks at the camera. And I kind of got chills when it looked at the camera because I'm like, oh shit, it knows I'm here. And then it just kind of jaunts off and around a corner. Yep. But man, okay, do get one of those, and then put a couple paintball guns on it, and there's your home defense. <sighs> Perfect. Yes, weaponize, weaponize your robot, Jason. We've never discussed about how bad that could be on this show. That's why I said, that's why I said paintball guns. <laughs> right, I've got that paintball gun that shoots there. pepper spray. Yeah, okay, well, that's great. Oh, okay. I, I am not people. Jason, I, you, you were just <laughs> complaining about how you don't have friends to come over and play Cards Against Humanity with you. If you weaponize a goddamn robot dog and have it at your house, there's less chance of that ever happening. Actually... <laughs> I live in the Midwest. Everybody's going to want to come see the the armed robot dog, and I might just make some new friends. Mm. Well, considering uh, I also found a Boston Dynamics uh, story this week, it's the Atlas robot that actually nails a backflip. We're we're going to die soon. We're just going to be killed by these things. <laughs> well, that's why I want to arm my robot <laughs> so, they, so to fight off the can, other robots they, that are coming to kill you. Protect me from the other robots. Yes. Right. Yeah, I think we've 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 read a few sci-fi stories that uh, basically had that exact plot, and it didn't work out well. No, and the problem with this Boston Dynamics, you know, the the bigger robot, the Atlas robot, and I guess even the Spots too. They just these guys abuse the hell out of these robots, and when they become sentient and see those videos, mm-hmm. you know, it's just going to be nothing but trouble. So yeah. if you get yeah. a Spot now and treat him, treat him nice, treat him <laughs> well. Make sure that he knows that you're a good human. You may have a chance in the upcoming apocalypse yes. and uprising. Your spot may decide to keep you as a pet. Yeah. I've always wanted to be a kept man. But <laughs> not really not really the same context, but what are you going to do? Yeah, I'd be a little bit worried when that Atlas, that five foot nine Atlas comes to decide to have sex with you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> That's why I want to spot many. <laughs> Media Candy. I've been getting really back into Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, mm-hmm. and I found an article on Wired, surprisingly, uh, saying that it's worth a second look. And of course, it's worth a second look because the first season was great. I don't know what the hell's wrong with them, but somebody's backing me up to say that it's a great show, and I'm really digging it. The first episode this year was a little bit on the sketchy side, but. Uh, it's really kicked up and I'm, I'm enjoying it just as much as I did last season. It's a strange show, but I really like it. Okay. Well, somebody over at Engadget is backing me up on Star Trek Discovery, uh, saying that after half a season, Star Trek Discovery is worth paying for. The show is good enough to justify a frustrating content delivery model. Now this is by Swapna Krishna over at Engadget. And I just want to say, fuck you. (laughs) It's a good show, but I am not going to normalize this bullshit about paying $60 out of pocket for one season to one show. No, it's not worth the content. It's not worth the distribution model. Is it a good show? It started rocky. It's getting better. It could become a good show, but no, no, no. This whole article is about saying, don't blame the show for the way the content is being served. No, screw that. Fuck it. Let CBS (laughs) know that that's a load of crap. This is not an endorsement of the model. It's simply an acceptance of the fact that this is the reality we live in. Hey, if we just accept the reality that we live in, nothing will ever change and everything will be shit. Fight the power. (laughs) Fight the power. <laughs> it's a fucking Star Trek TV show. <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> Fight the power. Uh, I, I agree with you, though. <laughs> Just very funny. Did you watch this? So you're, you, you're up through the mid-season. Now they're off to the mid-season replacement where people will be spending another $20 before they get another episode. 
Yes, exactly. So if you are paying for this, you should cancel because you're not getting another show for a couple more months. Yep. I I thought it was okay. It was I mean, it's fine. I enjoyed it. I like where they may or may not be going. It's definitely picked up steam. It's gotten more interesting. So the problem with the last episode is I think I, I put this in one of my new 280 character tweets is they used all the foreshadowing in the cupboard and they had to go next door to the neighbor and get another cup of foreshadowing because it apparently wasn't strong enough for their flavor for the foreshadowing that they were foreshadowing. Jesus Christ. Well, do you want to know why they probably had to do all that foreshadowing? Because of their distribution model people over at Engadget. If they didn't have this kafakakta distribution model, we wouldn't be have to do that because they're trying to keep your 20 bucks coming in for the next three months with no shows. No, but I, I, I was even talking about the foreshadowing that had the resolution in the episode. I wasn't even talking I know, about that. That was that. crazy. <laughs> oh, my God. Come here, son. Let's look out the window at the sunrise and let's talk about how awesome you are. And I'm like. Uh, okay. Next scene. I know what's going on. And in <laughs> there's one thing I'm not going to say. Well, it's maybe a it's it's a, it's a, I'm foreshadowing something. When when yes. when, we're, when you're skateboarding or in a any kind of extreme sport, the la- the one thing that you never do is say last run. I'm just going to take one more run. I'll be fine. That's when you break your goddamn neck. That's all I'm saying. True. Never say last run. Leave. Uh, do a French exit and get the hell out. That's right. Now, a friend of the show, Dr. David Teeter, sent us some cool mm-hmm. links on the Star Trek writer's guide that we talked about like four, three or four episodes ago when I was talking about how Discovery went off the rails because they did not follow Roddenberry's rules of Star Trek. Well, he, he yes. dug it up. So there will be a link in the show notes to the actual writer's guide. And he even provides, because he's a very thorough man, corroborating evidence of its genu- genuosity. <laughs> I know that's not yes. a word, but I thought it was pretty no. fun. Yeah, it's cool. It's it's super interesting. I mean, wow, what a different time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different it was a different time, but uh, I liked it. I it was in- it's super interesting to go back and read reads through this stuff. So, yes, it it's is. cool. Now, <sighs> okay, ma- okay, okay, I think I got out of my system there. <laughs> okay. Amazon is making a Lord of the Rings prequel series because the Hobbit 3 movie bullshit did so well. Ah, uh, oh boy, what could possibly go wrong? They've already ruined Top Gear. There's limited budgets. They have a horrible track record so far for t- shows. But hey, at least it's not being done by Facebook. Oh, come on. The tick was pretty good. I got to give him that. I'm still waiting for one for how many? Uh, Amazon or Mozart in the Jungle. I don't hate. Can you imagine a Lord of the Rings prequel done with the tick's budget? Well, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no well, that, that well actually, you won't have to. That might be you won't good. have to imagine it, Jason, because we're going to get it. <laughs> I don't know. That might actually be pretty funny. <laughs> right. So, yeah, this whole this whole thing comes about because 93 year old Christopher Tolkien, who is the son of the man himself, has finally retired. And everybody yeah. is like, OK, who wa- who wants some hobbits? Who wants some hobbits? Game, game on, people. Yep. Game on. Let's print some damn money. <laughs> yep. It's like he's, he's been here for 93 years and he's finally gone. We need money. Let's sell everything. So, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be hobbits. Hobbits as far as the eye can see for a very long time. Yep. Now, Brian, would you like to know more? About? Uh, Starship Troopers, one of my favorite movies of all time, is now 20 years old. Mm-hmm. Were you a fan of that movie? Because I have a feeling you weren't. I I saw it. I enjoyed it. I don't understand why there's a cult around it. <laughs> uh, it's just a great, great movie. Yeah, I, there's been lots of great movies I've seen. <laughs> yeah, but this one, this one is special because this is one of those ones. Where no, it's, it's, it's no, special. it's not. It's very, very special. <laughs> no. It's really not. Uh huh. Go back and watch it. It's really good. Anyway, since it's no, 20, shut up and let me finish my damn story, <laughs> and then you can go back and watch Starship Troopers again because it is a damn good movie. Uh, so since it's the twenty year anniversary, one of the companies who put together uh, one of the giant bugs, the mechanical versions of the bugs, has a video of the making of of the bug, which is pretty intense for what they had to do back then. It's made of clay and, you know, pneumatics. It's a big puppet. It's a very cool big puppet. And I, the mm-hmm. exciting thing about this is that they mentioned in the Gizmodo article is that this is labeled part one. So hopefully we'll be getting more stuff from Starship Troopers 20 years later. 
Okay. Yeah, you don't, you don't you go watch something else. You go watch The Notebook with your wife. I don't care. <laughs> no, that movie's got legs. <laughs> um, <laughs> apparently, Mythbusters has legs too because no, it they're doesn't. Rebooting <laughs> Mythbusters with a whole new team. Yeah, we talked about this a long time ago, Jason. As soon as it ended, uh, Science Channel basically announced that they were going to run a reality show to find the new hosts. And uh, we basically both vomited into our computers and moved on from there. Yes, but now they have the hosts. And now the show, is, show is going to... Ha- it's, it's actually, I think, already aired by now. I, 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 would, I would ask if you watched it, but I know you're not going to watch it. Not a chance. Neither no. am I. So if you're, a, if you're a listener to Grumpy Old Geeks and have watched the new Mythbusters, let us know what you think. <laughs> yeah and dennis villeneuve is going to be rebooting dune soon i know you gotta be happy about that <sighs> no <laughs> this is not this is not a book that can be made into a movie it just can't be if you tell me that you're gonna do to dune what you did to the hobbit with dune being 17 times the size of the hobbit sure you make a three-part movie uh you know each each is each installment's two and a half hours long then maybe maybe you could cover about 25 percent of what i like about the book oh come on man that david lynch version was awesome stings flying underpants there you go but it hey, had captain picard little je- it had a lot of people in it. Look, uh, david lynch did really good in terms of like nailing what the characters are i thought that part was great and i will always think of john luke picard as gurney always so very good stuff wait for my brother baron (laughs) and and that's my favorite line in the whole movie and they cut it out of the the short version i like the long version better i I gotta say well it needs to be it needs to be 18 times as long (laughs) yep and yeah. so so there's your reboot now. Re- mm-hmm. It's reboot sadness week here on Grumpy Old Geek. So yes, you get you get the Dune reboot. I get the Crow reboot. Uh, uh, fuck you. Fuck you, yeah. Hollywood. Uh, it's got Jason Momoa, who was, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, what's his name? Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Now he's Aquaman. Aquaman. <laughs> Yeah. Nobody likes Aquaman. Why would you make no. it? the only Aquaman that would be good is if they did the version that uh, was in the Entourage movie, because that would have been funny. But yeah, no more Aquaman, but leave the crow alone. Yeah, I, I'm not excited about this at all. And what's up with the artwork that's teasing it that basically looks like uh, the you know, Heath Ledger Joker? Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm, uh, I'm going to have to watch it because I'm just going to have to. But <laughs> Because you like to torture yourself. That's kind of it. I mean, as many bad movies as I've watched recently for the show, I could, yeah. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? Um, and for the people out there who listen to podcasts at super fast speeds, uh, this is a thing in the news lately. People are, I think they're called podfasters is what people are calling which makes no sense because oh my god because fasting that's that, that should be you're not listening to a podcast that's a pod fast but then pod faster is even more annoying than pod jason you've got to give me oh that god yes it's terrible <laughs> okay uh so but fortunately neuroscientist yuri hassan who is uh, he's got a lab at princeton and studies brain responses to real life events he studied how the brain processes sped up speech and he points out that even at normal speed, most people don't catch every single word that's being said. But if you make it one third faster, it's almost perfect. They don't lose a lot. And he also noted that the brain is easy, like able to easily adapt to different speaking speech, which I can attest to because I do it all the damn time. He says your brain responses become slower when I speak slower and brain responses become faster when I speak faster, which is why when I'm listening to somebody at like one and a half speed and then I go down to normal, they sound like they're drunk, much like the drunk uh, tr- the drunk Trump. Uh, was it on Jimmy <laughs> Kimmel, I think, where they slow down Trump and he just sounds drunk? It's funny. Yeah. But he did caution that comprehension starts to break down at 2x and at 3x it really breaks down. So that's why I'm at like, you know, 1.75 now and I, I enjoy it. And I know you think the, the people's voices sound funny. Your brain adapts to that so fast that you just never notice it. I don't want to adapt. Okay. You sit there when when I had podcasts, they were one X and we all liked it. That's right. Uh, but speaking of podcasts, there is no such thing as a good Bitcoin, Bitcoin podcast. If you can find a good Bitcoin podcast, let me know because I tried all of them. Oh, my God. People who like Bitcoin are not entertainers. 
But I was about to say, I'm sure there's plenty of entertainers in the field. <laughs> there is one who comes out of Nashville, and there's a lot of music in it. And there are there are right. there are Bitcoin songs, country Bitcoin songs, uh, Bitcoins, and uh, there are no, songs about Bitcoin. Sounds great. And like pancakes. I don't know what the hell is. Oh, stay away from Bitcoin podcasts, please. My dog ate the USB stick that had all my Bitcoin on it. <laughs> my wife took my wallet and she shot my dog. Boom, boom. At the library. I'm reading two books this week, but I only got through one of them. So that's all I'm going to talk about. And I think you're going to want to hear about this book, Brian, because it is Artemis. The follow-up to the the spectacularly successful book, The Martian, by Andy Weir. I am very curious. Now, as a sophomore, you know, book, uh, yes. these things generally don't go very well. Mm, we've seen many examples many of that. Many <laughs> armada examples <laughs> of really bad follow-ups. Now, that being said, I go into these books thinking that, oh my God, this is going to be terrible. This had two things that were interesting about it because I listened to the audiobook and it was read by Rosario Dawson, which is she's not known for doing audiobooks. Mm -hmm. Nailed it. She was perfect. Uh, the main character in Artemis is a woman, so it really helps out that it's not Will fucking Wheaton this time. <laughs> and she did a, she did a great job of all the characters, all the voices, and the book itself. Thumbs up. I really liked it. I really, okay. really liked it. There's some parts at the beginning that are you're just like, what the hell is this story about? And then once it finally starts to pick up and get the ball rolling, it is really, really well written and really enjoyable. Great. I, I have nothing I have nothing bad to say about this book except for that little slow bit in the middle and the getting used to because, you know. It's Andy Weir, so I had just the Martian on the brain. I'm like, what's he going to do? What's going to be this crazy thing? And it's about a city on the moon. That's in the that's right. on the tin, so I'm not spoiling anything there. But what goes down in the city on the moon is pretty damn good. And there are elements of things that are in the Martian that we all love, the crazy problem solving and things like that, but not taken to an extreme and just for the sake of doing problem solving. You know, problem solving porn is what everybody loves about this. It's the, the Apollo 13 scene where they dump all this shit on the table, you know, right now. I have, that everybody talks about. I, but yeah, I have just one question about this, which relates directly to what we were talking about with uh, Ready Player One and then the follow up that was horrible. Uh, when you have a very successful debut novel, as as Andy Weir did with The Martian that was made into a movie. Um, the the tendency for these authors is to to follow them up with something that is ostensibly not a novel but a screenplay. Does this read as a novel or a screenplay? Oh, one hundred percent screenplay, but it's going to be a really good movie. Okay, all right. Well, knowing that going in will make me less angry. Yeah, yeah. No, it reads like a screenplay. I this is a this I could you know totally see this movie playing out, and I was thinking about it in how they would shoot this as I'm reading it, you know? <laughs> okay, one of those. That's, that's, kind of, that's kind of what I figured was going to happen, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, but I do like to know that going Yeah, in. I mean, look at Michael Crichton <laughs> books. Those books were good, but those are screenplays too. But if you, if it's done well, the story's great, and it all kind of mm -hmm. fits together, but I really enjoyed it. I have, Like I said, I, got, I gave it five stars on Audible for both the story and the performance. And like I said, it was a really good performance. She did a really good job. Well, I mean, she's an actress. Yeah, but some actors can't really do the audiobook thing. Trust me, I've 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 heard them all. Okay. Well, good to know and because I've almost finished a book and we're taking next week off for Thanksgiving, this might be my follow-up and I'll have two for the next show. All right. Yes, I will definitely have at least one more for the next show. Security? Ha! We are back for the security ha segment with the Cyberwire's Dave Bittner. Jason is not here right now. I've checked all of his Chinese security cams. I checked his <laughs> Amazon key cam. He is he's, nowhere to be found. Right. He's out. He's taking Bam Bam for a quick walk around the block, right? Yeah. He's actually up in San Francisco doing a very special couple recordings with his day job, uh, The Art of Charm. So he oh, was nice. blocked out for this time. I think we're going to try to I'm going to try to catch up with him tomorrow to do the rest of the show, but he will miss this segment this time. Right. So it is our chance to make fun of Jason. 
Jason again. <laughs> That's right. Well, he's not here. Let's make fun of him. No, nah, we would never do that. Not you and we me. We would never no, do that. No, so no, no, I, no. I suppose we can uh, just leap right into it then. I, I believe Jason put a few stories in here for us. Uh, the first one that he mentions is uh, all it took for researchers was a mask to bypass iPhone X face ID. Yes. Now, it's a bit of a misleading title because it's yes. a little bit more involved of a mask than, <laughs> yeah. say, what you and I could go pick up down at Target or even make ourselves with I, I, Adam Savage would have a tro- problems on Mythbusters making a mask to this degree. Yes, because I, I was thinking of like a Scooby Doo mask, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I would have I would have gotten into your iPhone 10 if it hadn't been for the, these, uh, these kids <laughs> and their dog. Um, That's right. Yes, this is a pretty sophisticated <laughs> mask. And. You know, as soon as the iPhone 10 was released, the clock was ticking, right? It was the same thing with Touch ID. Any yeah. of these innovative security things, uh, somebody's going to break it. Somebody's going to hack into it. And so I don't think this is at all surprising to anyone. Uh, when we think about this, though, we, we, you know, you and I are thinking, oh, is somebody some some malicious friend of mine or, or I left my phone somewhere. Now they're going to be able to get into my phone. The concern about this, I suppose, is is we're having these ongoing lawsuits with these things like these mass shootings and governments being able to open up a phone. And certainly a government would have the ability to create mass to this degree, thus kind of bypassing the whole need for there being the legal checks and balances and and lawsuits that are going on about whether they should be able to do this at this point. Right. And I suppose similar to how they can force you to submit your fingerprint and they can't force you to submit a password, Mm -hmm. um, I suspect they can force you to, you know, look at the iPhone to unlock it if they need to. Right. Yeah. So I, I think this is that same as we talked about before. If you're a person who needs a high level of security, chances are you know it and you're going yep. to use something stronger than this. To me, this and Touch ID fall into the category of way better than nothing at all. So right. it's providing you <laughs> with a convenient way to have added security for your phone for people who find passwords just slow them down. <laughs> and what I've heard um, from folks who have Face ID that they love it because it just gets out of the way. They say after a few days with it, they don't even know it's there. They just pick up the phone and and boom, the phone unlocks. It's it's magical. Right. I, I, again, I mean, I guess it's all progress or whatnot, but is it really so difficult to put your thumb on the phone <laughs> as you're getting it out of your pocket anyways? But uh, it, hey, progress moving forward. So yeah. I like it, the idea. Uh, but yeah, like you said, if you are really concerned about security, you probably aren't using an iPhone. Right. The other, other interesting aspects to this, we saw a couple of stories this week about um, family members being able to unlock phones. And of course, Apple warned from the get-go that twins would be able to unlock the phone. Identical right. twins would be able to lock the phone. Sure enough, some people have demonstrated that. But there was an interesting one this week where a son was able to unlock his mother's phone. Wow. Well, that must be some strong genes between those two then. <laughs> well, it was funny too because uh, they interviewed the family and uh, the father said most people say that the son resembles me more than his mom. But I guess whatever the measurements that the system is taking, you know, he, he aligns more with the mom than with the dad. So... Right. It's interesting. And another p- interesting point about this whole iPhone 10 thing with Face ID, you know, over on the CyberWire, um, we interview people pretty much every day. We have security experts who we talk to about various things. And one of the ways that we find people to talk to is that PR people pitch us stories. Right. And leading up to the release of the iPhone 10 and Face ID, I was getting lots of pitches from people all about what's Face ID going to mean? How is Face ID going to affect security? You know, how, how will people be prepared for Face ID? And then once the, the moment the phone was released and Face ID was revealed and people saw it and used it, those pitches stopped because it works. Right. right? And so the fear factor was gone. Right. There's nothing to talk about. As Jason is always fond of saying, a tempest in a teapot. Yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that does seem to be the case. I, I I haven't come across anybody that's had any issues with actually using the iPhone X Face ID. Like you said, uh, the people I know that have it love it. They they have no problems with it. So Yeah, I played with it in the Apple Store for a little while, but uh, haven't, haven't pulled the trigger. Uh, not quite ready to update my phone yet. Right. So, But now that that iPhone in the Apple Store has your face pattern on it. <laughs> Yes, that could be a problem. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Don't do that, kids. <laughs> right. It's like the old joke on The Simpsons, uh, ever touched a penny? Yeah, the government <laughs> has your DNA. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. T- 
it's tinfoil hat territory. Oh. Here we come. Yep, yep. Uh, speaking of that, Jason sent us another little link. Uh, this is actually really cool. Uh, it's WebK has done it, or Robin, Robin Linus, and it's just a page that you go to that that basically scrapes every single bit of data that can be pulled by anybody with a web page uh, about your system and the browser you're using, your location. Uh, I, you know, we this has been part of of the DOM since the beginning uh, a mm-hmm. lot more limited we get a lot more information now i was even a little bit surprised because it's been like a year or two since i've done any really kind of deep development uh, yeah. where i was trying to you know trying to pull out information from people's browsers and what's being passed on there's a lot there's, <laughs> yes. there's a lot uh and i'm running some you know i'm running opera and i'm running a lot of, of different blocking materials and things like that but i'm still surprised by how much uh, information is actually being passed on what i really like about this site is they have recommendations for every single section saying if you do not want this information being passed on use this if you do not want this information use this so this is a handy little page i I tell i would recommend people go to our show notes and check it out and uh, if you are worried about your privacy and what your browser is is telling everybody that wants to have access to it about you, this is a good page to check out. I mean, I was shocked to find out they could, they know that I'm logged into Dropbox, which yes. is an application that isn't even running in my browser. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, my reactions are, are perfectly aligned with yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's surprising everything that they do know in here. Just It's all just here for the asking. Um, mm-hmm. I love the fact that they tell you how to block it if you want to. Um, I feel a certain amount of, uh, I guess you call it Stockholm syndrome to some of this now where it's just like, <laughs> oh, you know, they, okay. Oh, they've got that. Yes. Of course they have that. And they've got this. Yes. Of course they've got that. And so yeah, the exact same feeling I get every morning when I launch Twitter and see the news. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it really is discouraging, isn't it? It really yeah, this is, is discouraging. S- uh, what I've, seem to be discovering as a repeated theme as as i and jason and and you we sit down and and we put together the show every week now is this wasn't the way it was supposed to be (laughs) that is the overarching feeling i have almost every single time we do these shows now and we start talking about these stories and it's but it wasn't supposed to be like this (laughs) you remember the excitement the first time you pulled that 300 baud modem out of the box and yes (laughs) Yes, and all of a sudden, I was getting like these these bitmaps of of Star Trek images that right, I couldn't have gotten right. anywhere else from from Snoopy. from a mail server that came from Sweden. Yes, or whatever. <laughs> I was all like, "Wow!" Good times dial up BBSs, talking yep. to people all over the world. Yeah, and now well, they know you're using <laughs> Dropbox. Yes, they do. Uh, oh, well, uh, mm-hmm. Jason I'll throw, also threw in this story about Google chief lawyer slamming the right to be forgotten. And this goes uh, hand in hand with uh, the GDPR that uh, you keep touting and hope that will change the Internet for the better. Yeah, this is an interesting story. Um, and it's complicated. It, basically, in Europe, they have you have a right to be uh, delisted. So yes. you can go to Google and say... I want when you search on my name, this pops up. I don't want that to pop up when you search on my name. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, what if the thing, (laughs) you know, what if the thing is in the public record? Or, yeah, yeah, the things like uh, child molestation, things like uh, prison records, all that sort of stuff that Google is now arguing that the society has a right to know. Right. Right. And so that's basically what Google is pushing back on. There have been a handful of people who have said that they want certain, um, I guess, embarrassing information about them removed. I actually went through and looked up the uh, court case. I don't know if you went through and dug that deep on it, but um, I went and looked. I I followed all the links all the way down the rat hole. And Mm -hmm. uh, the requests for the information they were removing, I think there's a part of this you're really going to enjoy. Um, First of it, first was a video that explicitly revealed the nature of a relationship that an applicant was deemed to have deemed to have entertained with a person holding a public office. Okay, Mm -hmm. so somebody was probably had a I don't know. Let's let's just call it an affair or an inappropriate relationship with a politician or something, and they want that scrubbed. Mm. But but that's not a big deal in Europe. (laughs) <laughs> that's right from, exactly from what i understand that's a good point yeah i hadn't thought about that <laughs> uh yeah i uh, the thing is like who gets to determine what is what that's the real question right right 
Here's okay, here's my yeah, favorite. Give me your favorite. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a press article relating to the suicide committed by a member of the Church of Scientology, hmm. mentioning okay. that one of the applicants was the public relations manager of that church. Now that's interesting, uh, mainly because uh, the Church of Scientology are just uh, relentless when it comes to yes. having uh, information removed or trying to control their narrative. Things like that. Um, right. The others were various articles relating to criminal proceedings concerning an applicant um, and articles related to the conviction of another applicant for having sexually aggressed minors. Right. So. So. So here, <laughs> so here we're bumping up against our right to know. Yeah. If someone is yeah. convicted of sexually aggressing minors, that must be the European term for it. Um. I would imagine. I mean, do me and my neighbors have the right to search on that person's name and find the court document on right. that, the public court document on that? That's, well, I, one would think again because mostly they're discussing public figures here. One would think, okay, you can request some like crazy page on Reddit be taken down, but if you're a public figure and you've done something, isn't that going to be on uh, Times? The New York Times website, isn't that going to be on like reputable news journals? And you can't remove those, right? If it's news, then it's news. Yeah. If it's just, uh, I see, it's it's such a quagmire about who gets to decide what. And that's that seems to be the real issue. And personally, I would rather Google's lawyers not be the ones that determine that. But that's just me. Well, the other thing I don't understand about this is that, is this simply a matter of, what pops up when you search for my name? So, you know, for example, let's say I had done one of these bad things and you did a search for David Bittner and it came up and said that, uh, well, let's choose the least bad of all these things. Um, <laughs> c- criminal proceedings. Um, you know, I I, I, uh, I don't know. I, I cut down my neighbor's tree without his permission. Right. So right. Um, not that I'd ever do anything like that. <clears throat> but um, so. <laughs> Okay, so you search on my name, that pops up. I contact Google and say, hey, I don't like it when you search on my name, then it pops up. All right, fine. But if you search on, you know, the Town Gazette, Tree Cut right. Down, David Bittner, and the news story pops up, to me, that's within the limits of what should be acceptable. And I don't know how this works. I don't know how the request to Google works. Yeah, I don't either. I guess we'll be finding out because this is part of, of what we're going to find out when this whole thing goes through in the UK. So. Yeah, yeah. The other part of it is whether or not uh, a request for a privacy request in Europe basically um, has jurisdiction over the entire planet, over the whole world. Right. Yes. And so. that's a pretty big deal, too. Well, it's really fantastically murky, given <laughs> everything is in the cloud now. And how do you define where in the world something is? Right. If a story is hosted and it happens to be on a server in the US, but it's returned as a result in the uk and you request in the uk it's just it's also weird now (laughs) well and this is uh next year microsoft is going to face the supreme court on this very issue with their data servers over in uh, i think it's ireland um you know whether or not data stored overseas is subject to being searched If, if the fact that the data is overseas means it's not subject to u.s jurisdiction so the supreme court's going to have their go at that um in 2018. So interesting times ahead, I think, when it comes to data privacy. The cloud on trial. (laughs) Yeah. World's getting a little (laughs) smaller every day. Isn't it, though? It really is. It's kind of crazy. So I did lead in talking about the Amazon key. Um, Seems (laughs) from the what could possibly go wrong file, seems there's some problems with their security. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have not dialed that in yet. Uh, researchers from Rhino Security Labs found a way to disable the Amazon Cloud Cam, which is the safeguard for the Amazon key service that would allow the lovely Amazon employees directly into your home if you wanted them to, to drop off your socks and everything else that you get from Amazon these days. Right. Uh, the camera basically just, uh, the, the hack will basically just bring up a still image of there nothing of nothing happening, which right. you could see which and Amazon would see. Which is the worst possible thing that it could do, right? Like yes. A black screen <laughs> would be 10 times better than a freeze frame of the last thing of security cam was looking at exactly so you know then anybody could just walk in and go into your house and do whatever they'd like and they'd not be detected by uh, your monitoring of it or amazon supposed monitoring of it and amazon of course provided a statement saying we notify customers if the camera's offline for an extended period technically the camera's not offline is it 
Well, like, yeah, I mean, I they, they I are mean, I guess saying, it is. I, I think yeah. so. I think so. And they've said they're mm. going to have a fix soon. Um, you know, I, I say I have to say, um, I think it was uh, Andy Anatko, who's a, a tech writer for the Chicago Sun Times. He was talking about Amazon, and he said of of Amazon, he loves the fact that Amazon's attitude towards many of these sorts of developments is here, hold my beer, which is <laughs> they're totally willing to try things and fail spectacularly right. but at least they're out there trying well, I, I suppose that attitude would be okay as long as i wasn't the first test case for people <laughs> doing this sort of stuff right. which is again jason and i often say we will wait for version two of mm -hmm. almost any technology these days because nobody releases a version one people release version ones into the wild to see what's going to go wrong that's the way the world works now. Well, you know, the other thing I was thinking about this is that particularly if I had a small business and uh, when I had a small business, um, I really knew I knew my UPS driver, mm -hmm. knew him really well. You know, he's there pretty much every day dropping stuff off, you know, gave him uh, you know, Christmas cards and, and all that sort of stuff. So and often if, with a small business, there were times when the shop was locked up where we wouldn't get deliveries because there was nobody there. And right. so in this sort of case, if it was a situation where I knew who my delivery person was, I've known them for years, um, and all of these safeguards are in place, I probably would be okay with having but them that's drop it tends off. to, at least in my area of the world, that's not the way it is anymore. It's yeah. a different person all the time. It's shift work. It's, it's, it's not the same person. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, you know, in the Opie and Andy version or Opie or whatever the show was <laughs> yeah, back in that world, then yeah, that would make sense. I just don't see things being that way. The other thing that I had a real interesting problem with is I wonder who is crafting these Amazon responses and press releases because they the company points out that while the camera may be disabled, staffers aren't allowed to unlock doors without authorization to deliver a package. Amazon also claimed that it would be able to identify the couriers who all pass through background checks if they tried to pull off such a heist. That only implies that only Amazon people would be able to use this hack. I'm not worried about the Amazon employees so much as I am the people that are very good with being able to hack things that are not working for Amazon. Yeah, but let's be I, I think I think we're misunderstanding the hack, though. I think um, what the hack does is it merely freezes the camera. The hack doesn't yeah. unlock the door. Right. So Amazon still knows who's unlocking the door and that sort of stuff. They just you just lose your ability to see who's inside your house. Yeah. Well, in one of the most terrifying episodes we ever did, and I can't remember that episode right now, we talked to somebody who deals with breaking real physical world things such as locks and how insanely easy it is and how it's kind of almost a joke that we lock our doors. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. And then uh, this final story that we have, I found probably the most disturbing that we've done recently. Uh, why is this company <laughs> tracking where you are on Thanksgiving? Uh, I assume you read through all of this. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> this is really disturbing. Yep. <laughs> really, really, really. <laughs> you know, I have to say I've become a little numb to disturbing things in cybersecurity that I deal with this stuff every single day. But this one... <laughs> Uh, got it, my... it, take, it, it takes the pumpkin pie, as it were. <laughs> it really does. So uh, you want to do the rundown or shall I? Uh, uh, sure, I'll, I'll do the brief intro, then I'll let you tell people exactly why. It's incredibly <laughs> disturbing. Uh, a few publications ran with a holiday-themed data study about how families that voted for opposite parties spent less time together on Thanksgiving, especially in areas that saw heavy political advertising, which is an interesting finding about how partisan the country is becoming. Uh, but what they used is a company called SafeGraph that provided them with 17 <clears throat> trillion location markers for 10 million smartphones the right. amount of big this is big data actualized as a real fear because we've often talked about whether we should be worried about data big data or not i i would say after reading this article oh hell yes we should be <laughs> yeah so here's what they do um <laughs> they figure out where an individual lives and the the mm -hmm. reason the, how they do that is they they find the place where you are most often located between the hours of 1 and 4 a.m. so right. when you're asleep they look for your pattern of where you sleep and they figure all right that's where home is makes totally mm -hmm. perfect sense yeah. and then they look to see where those same people were between 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. on Thanksgiving day right so now they know where you live they know where you went they know who they know you were with. where your family members are. <laughs> right. Right. 
And they can associate this with all sorts of cell phone data. The story was didn't really say that they could drill down and know who you are. But as we all know, that's <laughs> not hard to do. Well, yes, they released multiple press releases from Safegraph's partner where they said the company's location data is referred to as anonymized. And I love that the article put anonymized in quotes, because (laughs) when you're providing exact addresses, it's not that anonymous anymore, is it? Because now you can search the address. There are purchase records online. Yep. These are easily connected. And by the way, those records are required to be online. So that might go back to the Google discussion we were having previously, because if you buy a house, that is public knowledge and everything right. about it is is all your information is there. And it's easily, easily connected to this location data. So it's not anonymous. No. <laughs> and as if that weren't bad enough, how does SafeGraph <laughs> get the information? We give it to them. Yes, we do. Uh, you remember a few months ago, there was a <laughs> brouhaha over, I think it was the AccuWeather app that was yes. secretly mm-hmm. uh, tracking your location and, and uploading it. Well, that's basically what SafeGraph does. SafeGraph contracts with other companies who are, they, they partner with apps. Yep. Um, could be anything, any kind of app. And Oh, the- and by the way, if you're offering your app for free and you don't really make a lot of money from the advertising, as we all know that you don't, if mm-hmm. SafeGraph comes along and says, here's $100,000, can we have your data? You're going to say yes. Right. Right. And that's what they do. So they gather all this data from these apps where people have given them, given the app permission to track their location because, you know, your flashlight, your flashlight app needs to know that. Um, <laughs> and that's how the data gets uploaded just to uh, SafeGraph. And then SafeGraph just sort of wipes their hands of it and says, you know, we don't have anything to do. The, basically, the privacy component is uh, totally up to our third-party providers. So right. we're just collecting the data. We don't have anything to do with the actual collection of it. That's between you and the the uh, skanky app that you downloaded that tracks your information. Oh, Brian. What a world we've made, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, really, if the more you think about this stuff, it's just the more terrified I get. It makes me want to like, go, I'm just going to start spending the night at random places. <laughs> I'm not going to let you figure out where my house is. Right. The crazy thing is like you can go through your phone and, and a lot of apps. Sure, you can turn off location data. And I'm sure somewhere buried deep in a term of service somewhere, these apps tell you if they're selling their data. They don't specifically ever say if they're selling it to a company like SafeGraph. I didn't even know SafeGraph existed until I read this article. Yep. Uh, we have no idea what's going on with all the stuff that we have on us on a daily basis now with all this technology. We don't know where it's going. We don't know who's using it. It's it's a terrifying thing. And sure, we can shut everything off. But if I shut off location data completely on my phone, I'm actually losing some of the valuable services I get from my phone. Right. And that's and yeah, and that's part of the that's another thing where the policy has to catch up with the technology, because there's that whole thing with the policy, with the legal framework where they say, well, by using sort of the um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, the tracking of phones, you know, well, by using the technology, you're submitting to being tracked. And well, you know. That's it's a different ball game now. If you're you, the, the technology doesn't work the way it should if you shut these things off. And yeah. so, I, I, again, I there's some hope in that. I think it'll be interesting to see when GDPR kicks in next mm-hmm. year how much that does percolate around the world. Um, you know, eventually, what, what I think maybe has to happen <laughs> is somebody needs to just doing start doing like a real time tracking graph of every single member of Congress. Right. Right. <laughs> well, I think I think I've got a little project for the holidays. Right. Then. right. Exactly. Because if you could do that, I bet this would be shut down. But quick. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, it, uh, we kind of almost need to point out to the people making our laws exactly what's going on and what better way to do it than by them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. With uh, that. With that, uh, I'm thoroughly terrified. I look forward to Jason uh, coming back, uh, not next week, because we will be taking Thanksgiving off. Yep. SafeGraph uh, will, Safe will know where we all are. That's right. Have a happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. Yes, have a happy Thanksgiving as well. So when we're back in two weeks, Jason will tell us everything we got wrong. That's good. I look forward to that. Me too. All right. Take care. Take care. Brick a brick. 
Atlas Obscura just constantly throws up some really interesting things. And since we just finished the at the library section and we've done a little bit of a uh, book porn before on the show, I had to mention this one. This is the Yangzhu Zhangzhuk, I believe. Probably got that entirely wrong. I should have asked my wife. <laughs> it's a bookstore and library in China, and it is stunning. Um, go to the show. Go to the show notes. Click through. This is gorgeous. This is one of the most beautiful libraries I've ever seen. Every now and again, I post pictures of library porn for Brian, and this this library was actually in one of those before. But now you can find out more about it, and it is what it. There's a lot more images. Yeah, yeah. it is cool. It is definitely. It is cool as hell. Cool. And the cool thing also about being at this Airbnb here is that uh, the owners of the the place that we're in here have a great taste in books. They've got the Atlas Obscura book that I was going to buy, so now I can check it out before actually dropping <laughs> the coin. Yeah. Now, we all know that the new Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi, is coming out in about, oh, what is it, about a month now? Yeah, a little little less than a month it's now. It's getting close. Yeah, so they, you know, they had to make a Millennium Falcon to shoot the show. And what do you do with a Millennium Falcon when you're done with it? What, 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 uh, what, do, you, what do you put it in the garage? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, well... Pinewood Studios, one would assume. Yes, you would keep it there, but... What they tried to do was just cover it with, like, around it with shipping containers, right? Because there are no drones. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, they, they, it's supposed to be camouflaged so you don't know what's in it. And, yes, right. if you fly over top of it, you could probably see it. Well, yes, satellites happen to fly over top of it all the damn time. And Google <laughs> Earth had the picture of the Millennium Falcon surrounded by the shipping containers. This has been out for a couple of weeks now, but I wanted to throw it in just in case you missed it because it is kind of funny. So definitely go to the link. Uh, I've, my, my link goes to Business Insider, and they've got a photo of it. Or if you have Google Earth, feel free to go try and dig it up and see if you can find Find it yourself. Go hunt for the Millennium Falcon, just like Jabba did. I suppose with all that Disney money, they couldn't really afford a big tarp. Yeah, you know, put a roof on it, baby. Put a roof on it. <laughs> moron of the week. I wasn't even going to have a moron of the week this week, but this came across my desk this morning as I was just checking the checking the morning news, and the title is what got me. U.S. Navy apologizes for pilot drawing dong in the sky. <laughs> this 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 <laughs> Navy pilot decided, eh, what what's the world need? Big dick in the sky, and he did it. And he did a good job. He definitely did a very good job. But uh, yeah, the Navy had to come out and apologize for it. So moron of the week is this pilot who is unnamed in the the piece on TMZ. But uh, you have to go click through and look at the photo. Somebody's going to be uh, peeling potatoes for a long time. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> oh, God. What a world. Feedback loop. We got some new donations over at Patreon. Thank you so much to the Recap Podcast and to Adam D. and Rachel P. And over at PayPal, Kira G. Thanks so much. We really appreciate the support. We thank you very much from the bottom of our heart. Over on Twitter, we got something from Ben Stanley. He says, I really got to find a better use for Twitter. The cryptocurrency from this wind-powered mining rig helps fund climate research. And we have a link to a story on digital trends where this guy basically rigged up a... A, a whole kit with a windmill. It's kind of neat. Yeah, it's pretty neat. It's neat, <laughs> as Jason would say. <laughs> and he also sent us, oh my God, you mentioned Lord of the Rings on the show today, and then Amazon announces they are making a series. FB is listening to you, or Amazon, or... Yeah, yeah well, you know, we once mentioned David Bowie on the show, and we all know how that kind of worked out. So now we're using our powers for uh, good, maybe, <laughs> with Lord of the Rings? Who knows? Yeah, orcs that look like ticks can't wait blue orcs that's all we need <laughs> well you know he i mean he named his rocket company blue origin so blue orcs aren't too far out of the out of the realm no all right so over at gog.show we got some uh, comments neil v hi gog i'm a legal user of cody i've had a myth tv box since 2004 to record tv shows off cable over the air and play content for my local nas media box i recently switched this summer from myth tv to cody because they have a better interface for the kids to play youtube videos of spider-man Drug and murder Elsa without ads. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, while I did not buy a pirate box from eBay, I took an old ultra slim PC, flashed the hard drive with... Okay, it gets into super technical tech, tech. details. My question to you is what device do you use to play local media on your television? 
I tried a Roku, which is great for Amazon, YouTube, and Netflix, but is lacking for local media. I have heard of Plex Media Server, but why provide a third-party access to my media server and attempt to charge me for more features to use my files? Feel free to adapt and paraphrase to better fit the show. Um, I have an Apple TV, which I find works far more consistently and smoother than the Google Chromecast that I also have available, but I no longer bother adding things to my iTunes media library. I just play them on my computer and shoot them over to Apple TV. Uh, to be fair, I don't do this a lot, so I don't watch a lot of shows that that way so it's not a huge pain in the ass for me but i can see how it would not be a viable option if you watch a lot of your entertainment that way and obviously you do because you say you have your whole own media library how very quaint how very quaint i have my own whole media <laughs> library too but i use i use my synology nas to do everything because you can basically get apps on the nas to become a media server and a vpn so you get all sorts of stuff the synology is pretty cool uh but it runs through my roku tv which has a media player built into it so anything that is broadcasting to the network i can just browse and play I used to use an Apple TV, and w the way I would do it, I was ha I would handbrake files that weren't MP4s or uh, M4Vs or whatever, however you, whichever you know MP whatever codec <laughs> that Apple will use to play through iTunes, because everything that you usually get is an MKV or an AVI. So the nice thing about the Synology is you don't have to do that cross rip unless it's an AVI. It doesn't take AVIs. But it's a it's a great way to do that with my Roku TV. I have not I don't have a Roku stick, so I don't know if that media player is in the stick, but I bet it would be because it is just a network interface to media on the network. But I don't I don't like doing airplay like Brian does or, you know, shoving it to the Chromecast. It just always seems to be a little bit too laggy. So I just went with the Synology. You can get a cheap one. Just throw, you know, one or two drives and you're good to go. I think the base Synology you can get like 200 bucks and then it's just the cost of the hard drives. Yep. All right. Next up comes from Steve Main. So here's something scary, guys, to add to the FB is watching. I clicked on an article in my feed and my email address that I only use with Facebook was automatically populated. How is it possible CBC has access to this data? I tried it on two different devices with two different accounts and same results. Scary as hell. Facebook is providing this kind of data to a site when you click on a link. Also, I have screenshots of this. Also, if you would like to see it, love the show, guys. I found you because I left Twit TV because of Leo Laporte's sexist comment on the show. As a 38 year old IT guy, I love hearing IT talk from others. Um, well, Steve, if you think that the Facebook is only providing email, you're in for some shocks. Yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, at some point, you probably a uh, uh, pop-up window probably appeared super quick, and you just kind of clicked on it accidentally. That gave CBC the right to have access to the data. End of story. And they have a lot more than your email, I promise you. Yeah, and it, but it could also be your browser. If you have saved passwords on and autofill on, Yep, it could have just populated straight from that because it's an email field, and boom, there you go. Yeah, there's a there's a couple different uh, ports of entry here that it could be. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you if you find it scary, the idea that Facebook has your email and, sa and shares it with people, you're going to be really terrified if you delve any deeper into this. <laughs> Don't open the kimono, dude. Don't open the kimono. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And next up is from Anti. You guys have the best podcast ever. I love to listen to you every week and have been spreading the word. Please keep up the good work. If you like Finnish accent and who doesn't? And would like to hear to have here what a smart industry leader has to say about machine learning and AI, but do not want to hear AI bullshit or someone selling you something. Listen to this. And there's a YouTube link to a talk. I'd love to hear how you would compare this guy to your favorite Elon Musk. Um, it's an hour and some odd long. I did enjoy his accent, but I didn't watch the whole thing, sadly. But he seems like a knowledgeable guy. All righty. Next comes from Levi T. I've been trying to post an iTunes comment for three weeks now, and I can't find it. I must not be posting. My original review was a little bit shorter, but something like this. I'm not going to read the whole review here, but here, here's the tip. The line in the middle goes, you guys are fucking hilarious and keep up the fantastic work. <laughs> Note to everybody who's trying to leave an iTunes review. You cannot swear in an iTunes review. They will just reject it. Yeah, thanks, Levi. And because Apple has awesome user interface, they don't tell you that your review is being rejected or anything. It just doesn't appear. Yeah. And another another little side note is if you're going to write a review, write it in a text document before and then paste it in. Because if you're doing it for the first time and you set up a new username and that username's already taken, it will clear the fields and say, give us a new username and start all over again. Happens all the time. Ugh. Because again... These are billion-dollar companies that don't think about the basics of UI. 
even though we managed to build this into everything that you and I built yes. all our lives. In 1996, yes. we could keep I know. state in a form. Jesus. It's so fucking frustrating. Uh, Anyways. Yeah. Next up is Jake. I was wondering if either of you use a system optimizer, and if you have one that you would recommend. Finally, is it worth it to purchase the full versions? All right. So I wrote Jake back. I use Clean My Mac 3. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is Jake's on a PC. His girlfriend's on a Mac, though, so she's going to get uh, the recommendation for Clean My Mac 3. But since you were a PC guy, I was wondering if you have, if you remember any recommendations for this from the olden days of, what, like six months ago when you were still using PCs? It's been a lot longer than six months, Jason. And uh, there was an array of different ones that you have to use on a PC. Uh, let me put a button on this and come back to it next week. And I will go back and find out the names of all of them. Because, yeah, there's... You, you, oh, man, you have to use so many different things to clear off your PC. Okay, yeah. Let me know, too, because I've got a PC laptop at home that I'm honestly scared to turn on. Because <laughs> Yeah, under understandable. I found out, though, that uh, <laughs> since I'm on Xfinity... You can go get a free version of it's either Semantic or Norton that will run virus checking for you for free. So I'm running Yay. that, but I'm still terrified to turn that thing on. That's how <laughs> doing security for so long. It's like having a PC just means to me it's like okay, it, it why bother? You're owned. <laughs> yeah, it's not that bad, but uh, yeah, out straight out of the box. It kind of is. Okay, this next one comes from Jimmy Hansen. Love the show, guys. You're awesome. Enjoy your puns and rants all the way from Sweden. Woohoo! But please, for fuck's sake, stop saying Mia Culpa all the time. Have an awesome day and keep rocking. When did we ever say Mia Culpa? Oh, we've done it a few times, and I think uh, it's important for us to admit when we're wrong on those rare cases that we do. Okay. I was just wondering if we actually use the same, the actual words Mia Culpa. I know I say we fucked up all the time, or <laughs> yeah, we were really wrong about that one. But yeah. Oh, you know well, what it was? Thanks. It was last week. I remember now. It was last week because uh, we had a, f a couple, couple brain farts on a few things. But yeah, yeah, we don't give a shit anymore. If we're wrong, we're wrong. Nah, screw it. Yeah. And thanks, Jimmy, for keeping all those illegal downloads that I get there in Sweden for us. Keep them coming. Yeah. Next up, Ted from Chicago. Your neck of the woods, yes. Jason. Maybe he'll come in over and play uh, Cards Against Humanity with you. Oh. I, yeah. He's probably allergic to dogs like everybody else. Have you all seen the new timeline feature in Google Maps? It's pretty freaky and accurate. I mean, it's good if you need to CSI a blackout, but otherwise having Google track me everywhere is super weird. It even gives you a GPS map. What do you all think? Um, same thing we've been thinking since day one. Turn this shit off. Yeah, I've never had that on. Not once. As yep, soon as they either. as soon as they had the the blog post about search history and they showed you where the the off box was off. I clicked it. <laughs> it's off. That's why I, I like on my Android phone. I can't use Google Assistant for almost anything because my search history doesn't exist on Google. Well, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Look, let me let me let me let me rephrase that. My search history exists on Google, but they pretend it doesn't exist and won't show it to me. But yes, the yeah. long awaited discussion I want to have about what delete actually means. Yeah, you sure as <laughs> shit know that 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 history is behind the curtain. But since I put I put I hit the on button for my privacy, they just close the curtain and don't let me see it. But they have full yeah. access to it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, next one comes from Jordan Hints. Hey, love the show. Found your discussion about 23 and me releasing our DNA interesting and was wondering if that would ever happen. And then I found this, which is a news article about uh, how the police can legally use 23 and me and other ancestry tools to obtain your DNA. But they can already do that with a court order to just force you to get swabbed or take your hair. So that doesn't surprise me. I guess it's if you're unavailable for, you know, to, to actually physically be swabbed. But and it doesn't say anything about insurance companies, but many of the companies are willing to, and some already have, given DNA information over to the police. I might have missed you talking about the police already, and if that's the case, or you already heard about this another way, feel free to ignore this message. Well, we hadn't heard about it, so I didn't ignore it. No. And as as we discussed in, in that second time that we really talked about it, we we went through an article that talked about the, the privacy policies in terms of services from from D, from 23andMe and some other ones. And uh, basically, they can do whatever the fuck they want with your information. It, it was very clear. So, yes, you are no longer you. <laughs> 
No. Uh, next up is from Ben Floyd. Hey, Brian, I heard you talk about Pepper Plate on the Face Booty Show and wanted to see if you'd checked out Paprika. It's an app as well. Uh, I'm a dad who does all the cooking in the house, and I love this app. It has versions for all the devices we use, has a sync function. So once we paid once for the account, and my wife and I can both add recipes, import, export to a variety of formats. Uh, he goes deep into the feature list here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I did I did check out uh, Pepper Paprika briefly. Uh, it's quite pricey for what it does yeah um, <laughs> yeah it, it looked really nice i did a trial of it a couple months back and i was like oh this is super super nice and then i found uh pepper plate which has every single same feature except for the sink but then my wife could just log in using my account we don't have to have separate accounts uh on her device and do the same thing so and that's free so Free beats expensive. Yeah, I looked at it. Looks like it's got a good interface and everything. But when mm-hmm. you look at fifteen dollars for the Mac app, then another three bucks for the iOS app, and I don't know if, if that's mm-hmm. a iPhone only or if it's iPhone and iPad hybrid, or if you're just screwed on the iPad. I don't know. But yeah, for yeah. twenty bucks, and Pepper Plate does the same thing, which I haven't gotten a chance to try yet because I've been prepping for this trip but when i when i get back i'm definitely getting my pepper plate on because i've got it installed and i've got all my recipe cards and everything that i want to get in there so i'll be able to chime in on this in in a couple weeks yeah i mean paprika is definitely prettier and good on you ben for paying for software and supporting people uh i probably should do that as well but i'm really new to this and i i don't even know if i'm going to stick with doing recipes digitally so i wanted to just basically try something out for free and uh, pepper plate is serving that purpose quite well yeah did you order your uh, amazon fire tablet no not yet i haven't had a chance and besides we're getting close to christmas so uh yes since i got those two fire tablets the first thing i did was i found the hd8 and installed installed pepper plate on that so that's where i'm ready to go that's my it's my cooking tablet Right. And and you can also <laughs> use it as a chopping board if you run. run yeah, out of might as well. OK, <laughs> we're finally into the iTunes reviews. Thanks, guys, for stepping up and getting us some new iTunes reviews. We got a bunch here. Thomas McNeil writes, nerds, better they suffer through the mess so I don't have to. That's correct. Uh, that's actually a friend of mine, IRL. So, uh, hey, thanks for coming. Appreciate it, brother. Next up comes from Kieran 007. Awesome show. I love this show. Great work. Sure. Thanks. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Like that uh, five stars. Yeah. Preach. 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 Next. <laughs> and uh, next up is Kitty X, who also gave us a five star rating. One of the best podcasts. Love you guys. I enjoy listening to all this content weekly and three hearts. Woohoo. And uh, after that, M. Fierro, also a five star rating. Many try. GOG succeeds. Many podcasts try to provide a good weekly tech review, but they lack the substance of GOG. Damn right they do. All right. Last one comes from Z9. I'm guessing that's how it's pronounced. It's an odd right. spelling, but cynicism at its best. The Grumpy Geeks, Jason and Brian, and security expert Dave Papa Roach Bittner continue to impress <laughs> week after week with entertaining insight into the tech and entertainment industries, as well as why our world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's a must listen. I agree, Z9. Me too. Thank you. If you want your question or comment read on the show, head over to GOG.show slash support and send us your feedback or questions that we can read on the air. If you're so inclined, please head over to GOG.show slash iTunes and toss us a five star and snarky review. And don't forget, tell your friends. Closing shout outs. So my closing shout outs go out to David Teeter, friend of the show, Chen, his lovely lady who we love so much, Jordan Harbinger and his lovely wife, Jen, for making this trip so amazing so far. And another shout out to my good friend, Kevin Rose, who I got to hang out with a little bit yesterday. And uh, and if you're bored on Thanksgiving, you can go download his new episode at theartofcharm.com. Yeah, very nice. I want to give a shout out to Gianluigi Buffon. He is the legendary uh, Italian goalkeeper who unfortunately Italy is not going to the World Cup next year for the first time since 1952 wow. I believe <laughs> yeah it, it was a big deal that Italy failed to qualify and it's a very sad thing because Buffon is one of the uh, he's 39 years old very mm. old uh, would have been his final World Cup and it would have, he is legendary so it's very sad that they had made it so uh, the diving Azuri dies again anyways oh well no World Cup for you uh, and also a shout out to news that just broke as we started to record. ACDC's Malcolm Young has died at 64, oh, one of the founding members. No. So sad to hear that. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. This so. is the first time you've had breaking news that I didn't know about. <laughs> I, I'm finding out about from the show. What the hell? My Facebook feed is just full of tributes to him. So, oh. you know, ACDC legendary band. Uh, sad news and, and far too young. 
Although I'm sure he packed a lot of partying into those years. Yeah, um, that's a, probably a rough 64. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just to let everybody know, we are actually taking next week off uh, for Thanksgiving. So enjoy your turkey day. We've both got family commitments and things to do. And it's a short week. And to hell with it. We deserve a break. I want some stuffing and cranberry sauce. God damn it. That's right. <laughs> so we'll be uh, back with you after the Thanksgiving break. Have a good one, everyone. Until next time, I'm Brian Schillmeister. And I'm Jason DeFilippo. Thanks for listening to Grumpy Old Geeks. To support the show and keep us on the air, go to patreon.com slash GOG. Toss us a buck a month and we'll love you forever. If you'd like to give a one-time donation, go to GOG.show and click the PayPal button in the sidebar. Show notes for this episode are at GOG.show slash 236. From there, you can find links to old episodes, leave feedback, ask questions, and get links to the stuff we like. Stay grumpy, and we'll see you in two weeks.